night by Don Jenkins of North Whitby Middle School in Oak Harbor, Washington. Don is a member of this year's Teacher Advisory Council, and he will serve as our TA for tonight's session. He will be active in the chat, sharing thoughts and resources and asking questions. Earl Lewis is the Tom C. Holt Distinguished University Professor of History, Afro-American and African Studies and Public Policy, and Director of the Center for Social Solutions. From March 2013 through 2018, he served as the President of the Center for Social Solutions. Um, from March 2013 to 2018, and I stand correct, he serves as president of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. An author and esteemed social historian, he is past president of the Organization of American Historians, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the recipient of 11 honorary degrees. He has held faculty and administrative appointments at Michigan and the University of California, Berkeley. From 2004 to 2012, he served as Emory University's provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs, and the Asa Griggs Candler Professor of History at African American Studies. In addition to prior service on a number of nonprofit and governmental boards, Lewis chairs the Board of Regents at Concordia College, is a trustee of ETS and a director of 2U and the Capital Group America Funds. Without further ado, I present to you all Dr. Earl Lewis. Dr. Lewis, we're honored to have you tonight, and we look forward to hearing your talk. Hearing your talk. Uh, Mike, thank you for that a very lovely introduction and uh, good evening uh, to everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. And I thought I would start by trying to set the context for why I decided to give this uh, particular talk the title I did, Why Colorblind Only at School, the Ongoing History of the Battle Over Affirmative Action. In part, it has uh, two, two origins uh, uh, in effect. Um, one is part of a story about really what's facing the Supreme Court in this term. Uh, the court, after um, not much hesitancy, decided to take on, uh, in, in the second time around, challenges to the use of race as one variable in the admissions process at both Harvard University and the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Um, both of those raise questions about whether or not the court will continue uh, to support the use of what we think of as affirmative action, which is the use of looking at multiple variables uh, in the selection process for constructing a class, uh, a freshman class, particularly a selective institution. My late colleague, the late uh, Kermit Hall, uh, who was president of Utah State, wrote a piece probably close to 20 years ago now uh, noting that uh, the battle over affirmative action was not about higher education writ large. It was really about who gets to be admitted to the most selective colleges and universities in the United States. That was one part of it. But the second part of it, uh, of the conversation and how I framed this, is actually informed by a recent book by Gary Orfield, a noted scholar of American higher education, uh, who is a faculty member at UCLA. The book is entitled The Walls Around Opportunity, The Failure of Colorblind Policy for Higher Education. And I will pick a couple of excerpts uh, from Gary's uh, 19, so, sorry, 2022 book. It's just out Princeton University Press. Gary wrote, since the Reagan administration, the basic approach to fixing racial inequality in the United States has been to deny that it is racial and to insist that it's the result of non-racial forces and that colorblind solutions will be fair to everyone. He goes on then to try to explain colorblind. And he says, colorblind policy means that policymakers refuse to consider inequalities by race as justifying special attention to non-white groups. Colorblind policy can be based either on the assumption that there are no longer legitimate issues of race that policymakers need to respond to, or in other cases, on a philosophical or legal theory that is radically individualistic, insisting on individual responsibility for one's own destiny, free of government interference as the basic proposition of American society. Gary says several other things, but there's one last passage that I want to reference at the beginning. 
He goes on to write, colorblind policies assume that looking at individual accomplishments and ignoring race in making educational decisions is fair. Their proponents argue that the failure of students of color could be caused by too much pampering, by low standards, and by what they see as a big welfare state. Part of what I want to suggest tonight is, is that we find ourselves in 2023 working against history, that in some ways, in many ways, in fact, that this story has its origins not in the last five years or the last 10 years or since the 2003 Gruder and Gratz decision, but really has its origins um, may, maybe perhaps going back to 1954-55, the years of Brown, if not before. Let's start with the years of Brown. I mean, in some ways, we find ourselves at this particular juncture in American history um, really dealing with unsettled law. If you think there's a picture of Thurgood Marshall on the right here, when Thurgood Marshall, before he was a Supreme Court justice, was the head of the Legal Defense Fund of the NAACP, he argued uh, before the court in 1953-54 uh, that separate but equal was not on the not only unconstitutional, but in the educational setting, uh, it was unfair and unjust. You, you see there a young uh, girl dealing with the aftermath of this decision. And for those of you who are students of American history, you're reminded that the court actually uh, rendered decisions not only in 54, but in 55. In 54, it overturned the Plessy um, principle of separate but equal, arguing that separate but equal was unconstitutional. In 1955, the court came back and said that schools in the United States should be desegregated with all deliberate speed, with all deliberate speed. Well, and I, I remind my students, I was born just in time for Brown II. I was born in 1955 uh, in the state of Virginia. And all deliberate speed meant something other than deliberate or speed uh, as we came to understand it in Virginia. Because even as late as 1969 and 1970, schools were principally segregated across the state of Virginia. In part, what we usually tell ourselves about this period is, is that there was Brown in 54 and 55, there were demonstrations and sit-ins uh, between 1957 and 1964. There was battles over voting rights and struggles over tr the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But in some ways, the story that in, within a decade, we have resolved most of the challenges facing Americans, uh, and particularly on the racial front, and things were going to get better, and things, in fact, had gotten better. And typically, in textbooks and other places, this is sort of heralded by the 64 Civil Rights Act, the 65 Voting Rights Act, and the 68 Fair Housing Act. This is a picture of Lyndon Johnson with Martin Luther King Jr. looking over his shoulder as he signs into law the landmark Civil Rights Act of 1964. But Johnson, as a Texan and as a Southerner, and as someone who had grown up poor and white in America, understood that advantage and disadvantage was not just in the stroke of a pen and the signing of a document. In 1965, he actually spoke before Howard University, historically black college and university in Washington, D.C., and where he didn't use the word affirmative action per se, but he had been involved in policy development in 62 and 63 that actually unearthed that word as he tried to figure out what to do. But he did say, and I think it's worth reading, it says, thus, it is not enough just to open the gates of opportunity. All of our citizens must have the ability to walk through those gates. 
This is the next and the more profound stage of the battle for civil rights. We seek not just freedom, but opportunity. We seek not just legal equity, but human ability. Not just equality as a right and a theory, but equality as a fact and equality as a result. Johnson, in a way, was noting in that passage that what we're struggling against and struggling with is history. That there is no way to say that on this day in 1965, the Starling line has now been cleared and we all enter the race equally. He's acknowledging, in some ways, the burden of history as we try to shape and direct and form and concretize a set of policies and what that all meant. He also was mindful of the fact that this era was not only defined by the success of the civil rights era, of the civil rights legislation, but it was also defined by an incredible period of opposition. In some ways, 1954 to 1970 can be thought of as the era of massive resistance. Now, most historians talk about massive resistance to the years 1956 to 1959. And what do they mean? They mean this is when the states, particularly across the South, began to introduce legislation and other delaying tactics to prevent the desegregation of public schools. You had legal concepts, concepts like interposition, this notion that states have the right under the Constitution to ignore federal laws if they're doing so to protect the interests of their own people in those individual states. An interposition and nullification that states not only had the right to impose themselves in this way, but they had the right to nullify uh, or to render void federal policies and practices uh, if they were in some ways undermining the interests of the states, asserting the power and the legitimacy of states' rights. It would take a Supreme Court in Cooper versus Aaron, 1958, before the Supreme Court to rule that southern states did not have the right uh, to, to impose their own will, that nullification and interposition uh, were not uh, affirmed legal strategies and indeed were unconstitutional. But even then, there was still a prolonged period of school closures. In Prince Edward County in Virginia, the schools remained closed from 1959 until 1964. That's five years. The young people went without proper access to schooling unless they had the wherewithal uh, through other means uh, to secure that kind of schooling. Even in big cities like Norfolk, Virginia, uh, uh, schools were closed uh, for a year as the state tried to figure out a way to avoid desegregating. And it's not just a Virginia story across the region. Schools in most southern states did not effectively desegregate until 1969, 1970, into 1971. And so interposition, massive resistance, school closure, court defiance were all elements of an overall strategy to avoid the kind of change that was implied by Brown and hoped for in the 64 Civil Rights Act, the 65 Voting Rights Act, and the 68 Housing Act. It also was matched by violence. And the kind of violence that we think of, in one sense, is by marked by the murder of Martin Luther King, or the bombing of a church in Birmingham, or the events on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma. But that was sort of what you want to 
think of as spectacle violence. You saw the violence that was there uh, when the cameras were on. There was also everyday violence that was a part of the system of subordination and intimidation, an attempt to maintain a certain kind of status quo. That violence was oftentimes counter, countered by a strategy of protest. Massive resistance was measured and, and matched by civil disobedience, where men and women and children took to the streets and reminded the nation and the world that there were certain basic rights that they should be able to claim. And that sense nonviolence was a strategy. It had to be taught. It had to be learned. And indeed, it was taught. And it was learned. But it's not to say in every community that everyone believed that nonviolence was the only strategy. And that's something to think about. But this period also introduced two other pieces in that I think uh, it's worth underscoring. One is, is that a lot of this required then federal intervention. States and localities and municipalities found themselves too wedded to the status quo. And it required then federal action sometimes with the support of the White House and sometimes with the support of the military to affect the kind of change that people were seeking. And by the end, by 1970, and certainly as we move into the era of affirmative action, we began to see this interesting shift away from a conversation about race per se and this would be highlighted after the 78 Bakke decision, to a conversation about diversity, and which is a complicated shift because some, myself included, will argue that by moving from a focus on race to a focus on diversity, we sideline the conversation about race and perhaps, more than perhaps, it is clearly a conversation that the nation is still to have. The events of the summer 2020, the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, among others, was another spark in that realization that there were some conversations that have been delayed for far too long. And we find ourselves both in a period now of reaction in some uh, localities and states as we try to figure out the tension between race and diversity. And it leads me to want to ask you, you know, thinking back on your own lives, as teachers and educators, as instructors and faculty members, as students of the humanities, what were your school experiences like? In fact, where did you go to school? What years did you go to school? Were your schools desegregated? What about your neighborhoods? Because we know that there's a close correlation between neighborhood diversification and school diversification. Let me pause for a minute or two, see what kind of questions you may have at this stage. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And they're all great they're all questions great as well. well. I have a, a I have question a, from Elena, Elena, who's out of North, North, North Carolina. And her question, and her is, question is, Begins with a statement. My high school I currently teach at opened in 1969, the first integrated in this North Carolina county, Moore County. That same year, a private school opened. Was this common in other southern towns? Private schools to bypass federal laws? 
the short answer, thank you for that question, um, Elena. And, and the short answer is yes. I mean, so what we find is that there were the birth of not only private schools, but oftentimes Christian academies across the South. And um, they paralleled uh, the final decisions in Virginia, North Carolina, down through Mississippi uh, to begin to desegregate the public schools. And what we can, what we know is for a fact that across the country right now, schools are more desegregated in 2023 than they were uh, in 1960. And so this is not uh, just by accident, uh, a parallel, a conscious decision uh, to create uh, separate institutions, both private uh, and sometimes related to these Christian academies. Good deal. Thank you for that. Another question Another about question the Prince about Edward decision out in Virginia. 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 Were there were acts there of self-determination or opportunities to educate the students when within the black community when the schools were closed? So in, uh, in Prince Edward's County, a couple of things happened. In some instances, uh, there were small attempts uh, to educate kids. Some young people were sent to live with relatives in other locations. Those who didn't have the fine, uh, financial wherewithal or the family connections to do so uh, found that they actually weren't able to fully educate their kids for five years. I mean, and, and you can go on, you can go online and begin to read testimonials from individuals because Prince Edward County was also part of a bundle of cases uh, that actually uh, helped to, to create the Brown decision. And so um, this is in some ways a real reaction uh, to Brown, uh, both at the local level and as part of an overall strategy. Okay, thank you for that. And there, there was a question as to whether some of these laws are still on the books in the South as well. Um, that's a very good question. And if those of you who have uh, students, that may be an interesting assignment to go and see what laws are still on the books uh, in the South. I mean, I know where I live here in Ann Arbor, uh, my colleagues in the law school have been going to see, for instance, how many of the communities still have racial covenants uh, in, those, in various communities in and around Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti. Now, I say that because the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Shelley versus Kramer in 1948, the racial covenants were unconstitutional. But um, I dare say that very few communities went and removed them uh, from the language uh, of those communities. And so we're spending some time uncovering them. My guess is, is if you did an assignment like this, you may be surprised as to what's still on the books. Good deal. Thank you for that. And there are also a few comments and responses to your question um, inside the chat box as well. Look, everyone is um, drawing up an experience from the 1980s, 70s, and as well as into the 2000s. If there are any additional questions that anyone would like to ask, I encourage you all to uh, put them into the, the chat box. But those are the questions that we have for now, Dr. Lewis. Perfect. Good. So if you begin to think about this period of 1954 to 1970 as the period of both um, post-Brown and massive resistance, and so these two things are actually happening at the same time. And then we get to 1978, uh, when Alan Bakke, who was a medical school applicant at the University of California, Davis, uh, a little older than the average applicant in his mid-30s, already trained as an engineer. Bucky was white, and he would come to believe that he had been denied admission to the medical school at UC Davis uh, because the school had quota. I mean, what he would allege in his petition is, is that uh, the school had set aside 10 of his 100 slots for African-American student applicants. And that was true. They, it had. And while UC Davis and the University of California acknowledged in court records that they had no outright history of discrimination 
that they were part of a medical system and an educational system in the United States that had indeed discriminated. And so they had set aside seats, they argued, to begin to deal with that history of national discrimination and wanted to be a leader. But in doing so, they set aside quotas. They set aside 10 seats. They also were really conscious about race and that not only set aside 10 seats, but set aside 10 seats for black applicants. And so 10 out of about 100 seats. Part of what they were trying to deal with, of course, is this whole dynamic tension between the idea of equality and equity. The equality assumes, of course, that we start everyone with the same kinds of resources, and then uh, they will experience uh, the same range of opportunities. But as this graphic sort of illustrates in a profound way, if you are 6'5", and you get to stand on a box, you have a much higher view than if you're 4'7", and you still can't clear the fence. And so what's equitable here may not look like it's equal. Well, the late Benjamin Hooks, who was at one point uh, both a noted civil rights leader and minister out of Memphis, Tennessee, um, used to give this story where he would tell the story about uh, the 440 relay, not relay, I'm sorry, the 440 uh, uh, race, uh, uh, 400 meter race, and where they used to start everyone at the same spot until they realized that the person on the inside lane and the person on the outside lane were running different distances. And so then they eventually went to a staggered lane. And from the outside, it looks like the person uh, who is on the outside lane now has an unfair advantage because they have been advanced around the track a little farther than the person on the most inside lane. But it's been hooked with say, but when they actually did the calculations, they realized uh, what had looked equal was not equitable. And in some ways, that tension of what is equal and what's equitable is attention that we still wrestle with to this day, but it was implicit and explicit uh, in uh, the ways in which the University of California Davis framed its petition to the courts and in the ways in which Alan Bakke framed his claims before the court. The court, of course, decided that race in 1978 could be one of several variables in admissions decisions, but could not be the primary variable. And that, in fact, race in and of itself shouldn't be a factor, but diversity should be. That what you're trying to do is create a diverse learning environment where individuals from a range of backgrounds can get to encounter one another and learn from one another. That part of the Bakke decision has been upheld until this moment, and we'll see whether or not it's reaffirmed uh, in, in, at the end of this court season. Now, of course, there were critics. Thurgood Marshall, who was by this time on the U.S. Supreme Court and who had argued the Brown decision, would write in a dissenting, uh, dissenting opinion, oh, how can you say that everyone has the same opportunities today. How do you discard several hundred years of history? How do you ignore 200 years of enslavement and 100 years of Jim Crow and segregation and say everything is equal? He was arguing more for equity. Majority of his colleagues ended up succumbing to the equality element of all of this. Equality, equity. How do we make sense of it? And it was not just then 
in the realm of higher education, there was a national conversation going on at this point in time that involved not only higher ed, but K through 12 and other areas. SONS stands for Save Our Neighborhood Schools. There's a consortium of communities across the country that would form in the 1970s, making the claim that desegregation efforts were going to undermine neighborhood schools. And what they wanted to do was save their neighborhood schools. And so this was one part. Anti-busing efforts, and not only efforts, but in some cases the violence that went with anti-busing decisions. The example here is not just the South, but uh, perhaps the most powerful images that dotted the evening news in those years in the 70s came from Boston, and where forces uh, across the greater Boston area opposed busing and did so violently. Also, though, in this period that we began to see an organized legal challenge. and the appearance of an intellectual rationale for opposing certain change. And so when Gary Orfeld is talking about uh, the introduction of a colorblind approach, if you think about two presidents, one being Ronald Reagan, the other one being Lyndon Baines Johnson, Johnson was comfortable talking about being color aware or color conscious in public policy to begin to correct decades, if not centuries, of inequality. By the time Ronald Reagan becomes president, the language system changes from society bearing some responsibility to, as Gary Orfield noted, where individuals now are responsible for their own outcomes and the, the greater society no longer has the responsibility for trying uh, to arrest or correct or repair harm and damage. The Baki decision was extended. So that was 1978 with Baki. By the time we get to the early 2000s in the University of Michigan case in Grutter and Grotz, there were two cases one involving the undergraduate college and the other involving the law school. What most people don't know is that these cases came about because there were opponents uh, to the ways in which the University of Michigan uh, had decided to diversify its student body. James Duderstadt was president of the University of Michigan in 1988. And by 1989, he would famously uh, talk about the Michigan mandate and the mandate uh, to begin to prepare a broad generation of American young people across race and gender and uh, class lines uh, for leadership roles. Jim, in this sort of rural, uh, he was a nuclear, is a nuclear engineer, but Jim sort of lifted the data and said, this is um, something that Michigan can do, must do, and should do. And so he took monies off the top of the annual budget of the university uh, to diversify the student body as well as the faculty and the staff. And so that was circa 1988-89. Certainly by the late 90s and early 2000s, Jim was no longer president. Lee Bollinger was president, but there were forces in the state who believed that the University of Michigan's position here was wrong. And so ads were actually placed in newspapers across the state of Michigan, saying that if you thought you had been denied admission to the University of Michigan uh, because of your race, meaning because you're white, uh, let us know and we'll file suit on your behalf. And this is documented. I've actually written about it uh, in, in academic uh, settings. And so this way in which a social movement sort of grows inside of the state of Michigan uh, to unearth examples of egregious behavior on the part of the university. What the University of Michigan does in its own defense after um, two 
classes the students wanted at the law school and one at the undergraduate uh, college, uh, it then turns to experts in law, in psychology, in history, uh, in other fields to really explicate uh, in great detail with a lot of scientific uh, data the value of diversity. And I have long argued that perhaps uh, the most important thing that came out of the University of Michigan's Bruder and Gratz decision was not the affirmation or the extension of Bakke, but it was the way in which social science data uh, and humanities data were actually brought to the fore. And in some ways, uh, it, no Supreme Court case dealing with education had utilized social science and humanities data like that since the Brown decision in 5455, uh, and where Thurgood Marshall and his uh, colleagues uh, leaned heavily on psychologists and sociologists and historians uh, to help frame the case for Brown. The same thing was true with Bruder and, and Gratz. What even the opponents of the University of Michigan agreed that the old bugaboo that somehow we were admitting students who were unqualified uh, was not true. They conceded that all of the students admitted to the University of Michigan were qualified. What they objected to was the use of race as one of the variables in the selection process. And so at least that became clear. It was not that somehow they were arguing we were uh, utilizing different standards for different students. They just didn't actually believe that race should be a variable. And you can go back and read um, both the briefs that were submitted uh, and uh, the expert testimony on both sides uh, that were made available. The court would rule that what we were doing in the law school was permissible what we were doing in the undergraduate college was too mechanistic, that in the ways in which we were assembling the class and assigning points, uh, et cetera, that uh, that looked more like we were giving points for race. And what they have said, what the court remain, continues to say, at least up until this point, is that a holistic review and an individual review uh, is permissible and mechanistic accounting uh, and, and scoring uh, is not. And they've also continued to argue that diversity in and of itself can and should and must be the focal point. Not that you want X number of black students or Y number of Latino students or Z number of Asian students or W number of uh, native students or A number of, uh, of white students is that what you're trying to do is to assemble the best class possible and the best class possible and that is diverse in all respects. And as some of you may recall that uh, when Sandra Day O'Connor wrote the majority opinion, it was 5-4, uh, she ended up saying, you know, I hope there is a day uh, when we will no how longer have to think of race as a variable. Uh, and that maybe in 25 years uh, from 2003, we can get to a point when uh, that's no longer necessary. We aren't quite yet at that 25-year mark. And even then, some of us thought that was ambitious because we weren't changing the ways in which the public school systems in the United States were uh, being constructed. We weren't making inroads uh, in real estate and housing uh, so that everyone had access to quality uh, public schooling uh, and where AP courses and a range of other things were available. It also was reflective of the fact that um, the University of Michigan, like most selective public and private institutions, uh, continued to have more uh, students seeking admission than there were seats. And so that part of this Ruta and Grants uh, is sort of part of the story, not of American higher education, as I noted previously, but is a story of the most selective institutions and who gets to get into them. 
and why they're important. And that in and of itself is worth a conversation. When we talk about affirmative action in higher education, are we talking about higher education? Are we only talking about the top 100 to 200 to 250 colleges and universities in the United States, however we define top? And so it's, you know, it's a question of what's at stake. Why, why Harvard, and why Chapel Hill? Who wins? Who loses? How do we define merit? Is merit defined solely by test scores and GPA alone? Is that how you begin to put together uh, an excellent class? I mean, I, I'm reminded uh, years ago, almost 40 years ago now, I was teaching at the University of California at Berkeley, and uh, Berkeley at that time had something called a special admissions committee, where a group of faculty got uh, the opportunity to identify 200 young people uh, in each class uh, who failed to meet the standard admissions criteria uh, for the University of California at Berkeley. But our committee got to spend some time uh, and reviewing um, these 200 cases, uh, we could send and did send interviewers into the field to talk to the young people, et cetera. And I remember there was this one case that has stayed with me for almost the entire, you know, at least 35, close to 40 years, of an African-American young man from South Central LA whose test scores were in the top 95th percentile but whose GPA, high school GPA, was just under a B. It was a B minus. And so we're trying to figure out something about this young man. And so we sent interviewers into the field, and this is sort of part of what I think of, how do we define merit? And we asked them, say, you've tested so well, and, and, and that stood out, but your GPA says something else. And he said, look, you have to understand my situation. Where I grew up, if I was understood to be too smart, that invited a certain kind of critique and a critique that could be personally dangerous for me. So I spent a whole lot of time working real hard to get a B minus uh, so that I wouldn't stand out. But you, as you can see, I do have other skills, and if given the opportunity, I would take advantage in this environment in a way I couldn't take advantage in my home environment. And I remember thinking, I'm glad I'm on this committee. We're going to admit this young man because it was the most analytical and thoughtful explanation of the discrepancies in his file. But if we only use test scores and GPA, we couldn't actually admit that young man. Because, and, and so I, I worry that in our retreat uh, to what we think of as examples of merit, we actually lose some sense of context and remind and, and forget that a, a lot of the young people that we're looking at uh, live in different contexts and then some of the students uh, who would favorably gain admission uh, to some of these institutions. So let me pause again. What questions, what thoughts, what's been prompted by the things I have just said? We have a few uh, that have come through. And um, I got a message about an echo in the back. I changed my audio settings um, to see if I can account for it, but I believe it may still be there. So I hope everyone will bear with me. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief. But it was a question from Lori. She said, I did some research in Charlotte, North Carolina back in the early 90s. Some black families challenged the narrative that Charlotte integration was successful because the burden of busing was on those black families. Is that something you've seen? 
Uh, I have seen that. And in fact, it leads to a profoundly important question of whether Charlotte and Durham and you name the city in North Carolina or city in Virginia, whether what was experienced was integration or desegregation. I often use the word desegregation because desegregation suggests to me that you remove the barriers uh, for attendance. Integration means that you equally share in the rewards and opportunities uh, uh, in that new environment. And so in some ways you're sharing power. And what uh, is suggested by this question is that black families uh, experience desegregation, but they didn't always experience integration because a lot of the change fell on them more so than it fell on uh, their white brothers and sisters and neighbors. Uh, and and as and as someone I'm born in '55, that meant I was part of that first class, at least in in my part of Tidewater, Virginia, uh, that went uh, that attended I attended segregated schools until I was in the tenth grade. Uh, and um, or through the ninth grade, and the tenth grade um, went to desegregated schools, and um, and even in the classroom, it was desegregated rather than integrated. While the school population was 45% black, about 49% white, and 1% uh, or or whatever the balance is, uh, 6% other, it, it that was not true in who got into AP courses or what would what. what we would today call AP courses, uh, who had other kinds of opportunities. And so for anyone who wants to go and study uh, this period, be interesting to us to go back and look at the curriculum and, and look to see who attended uh, and, um, and then what their experiences were. Uh, it's not only the parents, but the students. Absolutely. Great question. And there are a few responses uh, in the audience chat to some of your prompts as well. And uh, again, thank you to Don and TA for moving along the conversation. You guys are doing a great job. Um, but Claudia mentioned, in addition to access to additional resources for affluent families, it is the expectations, meaning kids are expected to go to college. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, sorry, um, Mike. Go ahead. No, it, it's fine. No, it's fine. Uh, uh, Lisa mentioned the GPA just shows you're good at following the rules. I lost my spot. Uh, you're good at following the rules, uh, you're good at following the rules following and doing what is expected is not a true measure of ability or knowledge. Yeah, and and how do we begin? <clears throat> One of the my framing here is to prompt us to ask: How do we begin to ask that those kinds of questions? We, is it that we are producing a successive generation of citizen scholars who know how to ask questions and who not only follow roles, but also and sometimes know how to create new roles that govern different kinds of contexts and situations? And where do we find that? I mean, I, 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 I'll use my own uh, my own two children. They're both in their 30s and, and very successful in their adult lives. But my daughter followed rules. My son did not. And and I can still remember um, when my son was in the fifth grade. He came home one, the first day of class, and the teacher still had up on the wall this award system. Uh, and my daughter had set the all-time record for that award system and she was five and a half years older than her brother but it was still up on the board and and my uh, son walked home came in the dinner table that night he looked in the sister and says Suzanne your record is safe <laughs> and, and, and we all knew exactly what he meant it's like no way was he going to be able to follow those rules in a way that his sister had uh, and, and I used to always say to him I said you're a big young man and you stand out in any crowd uh, and you, in that age, elementary school, you tend to bump into things and knock things over and uh, teachers don't understand that you aren't intending to do so. You just do it. Uh, and But you also will go through life questioning 
and which he did. Uh, and as he said, I got to college, and questioning for me in college was fine. But boy, those first 12 years, every time I raise a question, I'd get in trouble because I would follow up with a second question and a third because sometimes the first question didn't make any sense. I mean, answer didn't make any sense. And so you think of that as just sort of a personal example, but if you extrapolate there and think about the number of young people who find themselves then unable to claim a voice, and then you ask them, can they imagine going on to college if they don't have parents who've already done so, or someone else in their environment, be it a teacher or a counselor or a mentor, uh, who's providing them with a way to imagine themselves in a different setting. That's part of the work I think we have before us. And it's certainly part of the work if we are going to claim that somehow we are more colorblind than we are. Very, very good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Felicia had a question about what qualifies as one of the top schools. You mentioned um, earlier discussing uh, what schools are considered top schools, but her question is, is uh, how does a school um, receive that designation? Um, is it based on um, alumni? Is it based on students going on to, to uh, do awesome things in their chosen career? Or is it based or on the academic scholarship at the institution, the professorships, uh, or uh, just or revenue just in general? Revenue that was the question she asked. Yeah, it's a, it's a brilliant question. Uh, thank you for it. And, and, and it says something about uh, our ranking system, right? And so right now, I think we're too reliant upon U.S. News and World Reports to tell us what the top schools are. They have a formula that they tweak every year so they can continue to sell magazines. Uh, and in there, they will look at a host of variables. Uh, how, um, how many students enter in year one and graduate by year six? And so they calculate that and that's a variable. Uh, what's, the, what's the input? That is, what's a, what high school did a kid go to? How many, G, how many AP courses did they take while they were in high school? Um, how stringent or, or rigorous was the curriculum in a high school? How, what was their GPA and, 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 and uh, or average GPA for a class, et cetera, et cetera? So that also goes into it. They look at um, the jobs that graduates have, um, both uh, once they get out and several years later. They look at the amount of money that a school uh, has in its endowment. Uh, they will sometimes look at and see uh, how many uh, Pell uh, eligible students are at an institution uh, and whether or not there's the kind of economic diversity that's there. And they look at indeed the success of the faculty as scholars and researchers and all. And, and, and that gives you an answer, right? But it doesn't tell you that uh, Xavier in Louisiana produces more black uh, physicians per capita than any other institution in the United States. And so if you begin to ask different kinds of questions, you get a different sort of slice of what you mean by top. And I think part of what I usually say to parents uh, who are anxious about what if their kid's going to get into this Ivy League school or this uh, potted Ivy or um, this uh, selective public institution the great thing about the university, I'm sorry, the great thing about the United States, there are more than 4,000 secondary, post-secondary institutions in the United States. Uh, and what you want is to find a place that's a good fit for your kid and, and for what they want to achieve, um, rather than who define, who, which institutions define as top. And I think the question uh, and the questionnaire is really raising profoundly important questions about uh, how we allow one or two entities, be it U.S. News or World Reports or something else, to tell us and define for us what is top. I agree. That's a I great agree. question, and Felicia, thank you for asking that. Uh, the next question will actually lead directly into your next set of slides, which is 
Um, how many of you, many of you have, have ever played, played the ever racial, played racial, racial guessing game? game? Carolyn had a question, Carolyn had a about, question about that. She wants you to say, more, say about more about that question. Sure. I, I love this question. I used to ask this. There are a lot of people who have said to me they're colorblind. They don't see race. They only see a human being. And that's okay. I believe you. I think. Let me ask you a question. So how many of you have ever walked down the street and you saw someone coming toward you? And um, before you thought about it, you realized there was someone ambiguous and you were trying to figure out what they were. And before you realized that you were putting them into some box in a ways in which we sociologically organized the world, and it was a gender box or a race box, or a religious box, or some kind of box. And when I've asked this question now for almost 40 years of students, invariably I'll get one or two students who say they've never played the racial guessing game. The other 90-some percent will say, yeah. I mean, truth be told, yeah, I have. Uh, And I'm mindful of that when people say they're colorblind. And I go, I have a hard time believing you. I love to believe you, but I have a hard time believing you. So I, I'm curious, is there anyone here who's never played the racial guessing game? Because I confess I have, uh, even when I know better. I mean, I can tell you about human, the human genome and that all human beings share 99.9% of the same uh, DNA in that category we call race is about one-tenth of 1% one of human variation or difference. Uh, that's 100,000 basis points. Uh, and, and so in some ways, I would argue that all human history has been written about that one-tenth of one percent of difference uh, rather than the 99.9% of, of similarity. But we still find ourselves being socialized in an effective way and playing some part of that racial guessing game. There are anthropological and sociological reasons for having done so and for continuing to do so. So let me uh, kick the question back out. Um, how many of you have ever played the race, the racial guessing game? And I'll ask you I'll all ask to re- you respond, all in respond in the chat. Lori mentioned Lori that mentioned personally, that I find colorblind color insulting. insulting. If you don't see color, you don't see the person as an individual. Yeah. Jessica said Jessica she's said guilty. She's guilty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Dina said all the time. And yes, so a lot of responses and affirmation. And, and, and so um, it almost, almost makes me wonder how do we find ourselves trapped in a language system where we're taught in a, in a set of social policies where we're talking about colorblind in a color conscious world? I mean, I was thinking about this as I was preparing this, and some of you may have seen this piece in the New York Times. Uh, Nathan Conley and Shanti Mott are um, both earned their PhDs from the University of Michigan. Uh, Nathan is a faculty member in history at um, and Johns Hopkins University. And they were trying to refinance their house uh, in the greater Baltimore area. And um, they had an appraiser come in and gave them what they thought was an exceptionally low appraisal of their home. Now, what this appraiser didn't know is that Nathan is a noted urban historian, so he, and he studies redlining, among other things, uh, and, and, uh, and real estate practices. So he decided to run his own experiment. They took off all of the, uh, he and Shonda took off all of the um, symbols of African-American culture and life in their homes and made it more neutral. And then they did something else. They left their house and had one of their white friends and neighbors come in uh, and um, stand there uh, when the appraiser came back out. And lo and behold, the value of their house went up $200,000 or more. And you know, Mason says, and, and Shanti say to the um, 
New York Times. I don't think this was colorblind. That's one example. There are sociological and um, political science and economic experiments that have been run by scholars that show that this pattern is more pervasive than we care to admit. There's a recent piece that noted that um, the average African-American real estate uh, agent uh, earns three times less than his or her white counterpart and are now developing strategies to try to figure out how to overcome that kind of discrepancy. I mean, and, and so how do we begin to talk about then these factors when you, if the argument is it's only about the individual and it's not about the ways in which we teach about our past? And, and that's an incredibly important set of questions that Gary talks about when he talks about the walls around opportunity and thinking through um, this in his view, and I think I share this view, that um, this soft narrative that we're somehow colorblind. Because in some ways, it also begins to beg a second question. My argument is these days, if we're going to end up arguing that affirmative action in and of itself has outused its youth, youthfulness, then perhaps we're finally going to be forced to confront uh, the whole question of reparations. And reparations is not an un-American concept, and it's certainly not an unknown concept globally. Germany continues to pay reparations to the state of Israel and the descendants uh, of the Nazi concentration camps. Canada has announced a major effort uh, to help repair the hurt and the harm and the trauma that First Nation peoples in Canada experience in the boarding schools across Canada. South Africa, as part of its reparations efforts, uh, had perhaps one of the most extensive truth and reconciliation um, movements that we've seen you know, led by the late uh, Desmond Tutu. But even in the United States, the first example of reparations dates from 1783. A woman, Belinda Sutton, who had done service as an enslaved person on a plantation in the Barbados owned by Isaac Royal, was transferred from that Barbados uh, plantation to a plantation uh, or a farm uh, area in Massachusetts. And after the American Revolution, she argued that she had been working for years in an uncompensated way. And now, with the abolition of slavery coming in Massachusetts, she should in some ways be compensated. That argument was forged again after the Civil War, and individual African Americans uh, were able uh, to uh, secure uh, some versions of reparations. I mean, the most well-known example in general American history is the passage in 1988 of the Civil Liberties Act uh, in which uh, Japanese Americans who had been interned during World War II were given $20,000 each uh, for the suffering and the loss that they incurred uh, during the war. And some of you, no doubt, know the story of the late uh, John Conyers, who was a congressman, Democrat uh, from Michigan, Detroit, who circa 1988 uh, began to introduce uh, in Congress uh, a bill that became known as H.R. 40, which was calling for a commission to study reparations uh, for descendants of enslaved people in the United States. And that uh, bill was then picked up by Congresswoman uh, Robert Jackson Lee, who ended uh, up garnering finally enough votes to get it out of committee uh, two years ago, although it had failed uh, to be able uh, to move uh, to full execution. At the same time, this is going on at the federal level. We have community efforts in places like Evanston, in Asheville there in North Carolina, uh, in San Francisco, in St. Paul, 
uh, new efforts in Detroit uh, and across the nation where there are these new community efforts to begin to look at then repair uh, and racial repair and reparations. And at state levels, I think California is taking the lead right now as the probably the only state that I'm aware of um, that has an effort underway to begin to talk about race and um, repair and reparation. But a lot of people don't, let me go back before there, but a lot of people don't know that perhaps the most, um, not quite celebrated, but perhaps the most uh, noted case actually involved Native Alaskans. And so when Alaska was admitted uh, to the Union as a state, uh, part of the understanding was is that Native Alaskans would be granted access to 44 million acres of land uh, in Alaska in perpetuity. Uh, and in addition, that eight Native corporations would be formed in Alaska, and they would be seeded with about a billion dollars in capital uh, back in the 1970s. And so those eight corporations still exist. The 44 million acres of land may not mean a lot to you, but if you understand that in the lower 48, Native peoples got around 50 million acres of land, it gives you some sense of the scale of what happened for Native Alaskans as perhaps one of the greatest examples of reparations as part of, in this case, federal and state action uh, to address a whole set of wrongs that have been uh, perpetrated. Those examples raise questions about then what happens on the other side. If we find ourselves at the end of this Supreme Court cycle overturning the Bakke principle, where we are told that diversity uh, is no longer a justifiable claim uh, for using race as one of the variables uh, for admissions in higher education. The question becomes then, how do we, what happens there in a world where we're also moving uh, in another direction? And that direction uh, has to do with local calls for reparation. And so I, I had a handful of questions here. Uh, I'm happy to have my questions entertained, but I'm also happy uh, to entertain whatever questions you may have at this stage. Okay, great, and thank you, Dr. Lewis. I'm going to go through, I have uh, maybe three questions that I'd like to present to you. And my question is, is, now that most colleges and universities are making SAT optional, how does that affect African American students? Is it safe to say the people on the admission board are probably still looking at test scores, or are they really going uh, to be a colorblind or test blind approach? That's a very good question, and I wish I had a general answer that I could offer. I know, so when I was provost at Emory University, and this was 2004 to 2012, I went over to my then head of admissions, and I said to him, uh, could we create a class if we no longer had access to ACT or SAT scores? And he said, oh, sure, of course we could, Earl. And so I remember looking at him and said, okay, so why do we rely upon them? And he said, well, because so many of our peers do. And I thought, well, that's a good cop-out. Um, sometimes you want to lead rather than be led. Uh, and so we had conversations, but he was anxious because going back to U.S. News and World Reports and some of the other things that um, pulling out may have uh, unintended consequences uh, for us in our ranking. And um, I say that now because the question uh, and the questioner knows with more and more institutions going test optional, yeah, I think it provides some additional opportunity for schools to begin to think anew about what is most important to them. Now, what I didn't say about Michigan, for instance, is that um, although we won uh, and the Supreme Court in 2003 
uh, in the years that I was away, I was away from the University of Michigan from 2004 into 2018, uh, the state passed a referendum that barred the use of race and gender in admissions decisions. And so we're no longer able to collect those data. Uh, and as you would expect, because uh, it was true in California as well, uh, where they had a proposition that banned the use of race, uh, uh, racial data in admissions, the number of students, particularly of black and brown students, uh, dropped substantially uh, because then you were over-reliant uh, upon uh, the test scores. I'm optimistic that more and more schools are going to step away from this, and particularly, and this is the catch, particularly depending upon what the court says. If the court becomes all the more rigid in what can be accepted and what won't, I think more schools will actually move away from testing and test scores uh, and find a new way, a new portfolio, a new way of beginning uh, to really assemble a class because it would be in their self-interest to do so. Very good, very good. Very good. Carolyn's question Carolyn's is, question is, is it claiming is it to be claiming colorblind, colorblind, like saying white, white lives matter? Like saying which lives matter? <laughs> is it claiming is it to be claiming colorblind, to be colorblind, colorblind like, saying like saying white lives, white lives matter? matter. The, standard the standard sometimes, sometimes uh, curtain response curtain to black lives, lives matter, matter, and then the response is, is well, white, white lives, lives matter, matter or all lives all matter. matter. The question is, is it claiming to be colorblind like saying the white lives matter or all lives matter? Yeah, I I mean, I wonder if the people who um, utter those phrases actually are colorblind. Uh, I mean, I think sometimes that this is a convenient screen to hide behind uh, when people either want to introduce policies that they believe will advantage one community uh, and particularly, in some cases, a community that may be voting for a particular politician. Uh, and so so there's the whole political side of all of this and the policy side. And then there's a the rhetorical side where um, some people, I do believe, believe that all lives matter. And, they, and that's, that's their first position and their last position. Uh, for others, I would suggest on the rhetorical side, uh, it is a way to avoid the harder question. Of okay, if li- if Black Lives Matter, when do they matter? Or as I said in a talk a couple of years ago, I have a Black Lives Matter sign uh, out on a major road here in Ann Arbor, the property I'm on, uh, to the butt. And I swear that some people, there's no punctuation with this sign. But some people, I think, see it with an exclamation point. Some people see a period where there's no period. And other people see a question mark. And so I think it's that range of responses, right, to that phrase, whether you see a period, an exclamation mark, or a question mark, or no mark at all, tells us a whole lot about the rhetorical side of all of these phrases. Thank you. Thank you for that response. And Dr. Lewis, I'm going to do a little bit of troubleshooting while I read this last question because um, it'll take me a little bit longer to read it. If you will, mute on your end, and I'm going to read it out because I'm still getting messages about uh, the echo. But if you will, and then uh, if you unmute to respond to it, if you will. All right. Good evening, Dr. Lewis. It seems as if many Americans have struggled with thinking about structures and systems and automatically fall back on individualism, which seems to undermine equity and leads to non sequitur statements like, I don't see color. Could you please tell us your thoughts on this observation? Thank you very much. And that's from Daniel Class. Thank you for that, Dr. Thank you for that, Dr. Thank you. I'm I'm muted. I'm a historian, and I'm a social historian, and so I always see structures, but I also see individuals. And I think society is actually uh, about the interaction between structures and individuals. And sometimes we pull out an individual story to illustrate a point, um, but then the question almost always becomes, um, it's this point, or it's this individual 
uh, normative, that is, are they representative of anyone beyond this particular case, or are they representative of a whole group of folks who've had these kinds of experiences? Certainly, if you think about American history as three different periods, there's a period of enslavement, uh, so roughly 1619 to 1865, a, a little later. Then there's the period of uh, what I can think of as the emergence of a Jim Crow world or segregation. So from the 1880s uh, to the eight, to the 1960s, uh, not the 1970s. And then the post 1970s, there is this period when we went from a war on crime um, to a, a war on drugs and the period of mass incarceration. And so there's a third uh, period there. In each of those periods, enslavement, Jim Crow, mass incarceration, it's almost impossible to actually tell those histories fully without talking about structures. But also, those structures were animated by individuals. And so we end up finding ourselves having to deal with both. Your questioners, real question has to do with our failure to look at the structures. And Right now, we find ourselves at a moment in American political discourse where people want to deny that there is anything systemic, uh, and that it all turns on the role of individuals, and that each of us indeed is born with the same opportunities, and that the accident of birth that has me born into one family rather than another, one zip code rather than another, uh, really has no consequence on my life. Uh, Scholarship and experience uh, would say that's a false premise, and that indeed uh, structures really do play a way, a role in shaping lives. I'll end with an example. Three or four years ago, a group of black students in the city of Detroit sued the state of Michigan and sued the city of Detroit because what they came to realize is that uh, while they had a constitutional right to an education, the books that were provided them in the city of Detroit were not only 10 to 15 years old, but there weren't enough for all the students in the class. They sued the state, saying that the state had denied them the tools to be a full citizen in the 21st century. Powerful suit if you go and read about it. And these young people were arguing that this failure on the part of the state of Michigan, enabled by the city of Detroit, meant that they were then deemed to be second-class citizens uh, in a digital world, and that they were not only literate, illiterate, uh, but that they did not have the numeracy skills to be successful in their lives. Uh, the case went through the appellate level uh, of the courts. And the courts actually found for the students. This is one of the few examples in recent years where at least one set of courts in one jurisdiction argue, yeah, there are systems. And these systems can actually injure individuals. And, and no matter what the individuals try to do, they can't overcome the system effect. And so systems do matter. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm looking at our time now. We have about four minutes left. And I believe that's all the questions that we have for now, Dr. Lewis. So if you would like to close, um, we'll go ahead and finish up. Well, what I will close by saying is uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your attention. It's fascinating to talk to my screen knowing that you are on the other side, but not able to see your body language or, or any of the things that comes with uh, speaker audience interaction. Um, but I am delighted by the questions you pose, um, by your attention to this topic, and I hope you will continue to read uh, in this area. I mean, three points I hope you take away uh, from this is that. This is a case, as humanists, we know that words and ideas 
and concepts do play an important role in shaping what is understood and how it is understood. And our job at times is to actually try to find and understand the origins of those words and phrases and concepts and to put them in context. And that's what I was trying to hint at tonight, that as we look to the spring and the summer as the court um, renders its next decision about affirmative action, we may find ourselves particularly uh, given the makeup of this court uh, with a retreat uh, from the Baki decision and retreat from Gruder and Graz and all the other cases in between. That then opens up new possibilities for all of us who are educators uh, to raise new questions about what's possible and how do we create an America uh, that is truly uh, inclusive, that not only begins to define diversity, but values and leverages that diversity for the prosperity of all. That's our challenge mm -hmm. and that's our opportunity. And I applaud you for the work that you do. And I thank you for attending tonight. Thank you so much, sir. So thank much, you sir. so thank much. You so I'm looking at all the things that are populating that are the populating audience, the chat, audience now. chat now. So, um, so, um, while Dr. Lewis Butte, I want to thank you all, all 314 of you who are present here tonight. But thank you, Dr. Lewis, for joining and leading us as we uh, all uh, just found your your discussion uh, very illuminating. And uh, we'll continue to follow things uh, because uh, we have a monumental uh, six months to a year, which is going on. But thank you for joining and leading us as well as sharing your experience with us all. We've truly enjoyed this experience. And I will go on to say that uh, for everyone who's listening, please, please continue to follow um, the events at the National Humanities Center. Um, you are able to access all of our resources on our website, nationalhumanitycenter.org. Uh, thank you for spending your evening with us. And a special thanks to Don Jenkins for your service on the Teacher Advisory Council and being very, very active in the chat. I encourage you all to uh, check us out for our next webinar, Looking for the Good War, January the 17th, with Elizabeth D. Samet, Professor of English, Department of English and Philosophy, the United States Military Academy, West Point. Again, it's great to see you all. We wish you all the best and continue to have a, a great week and an awesome weekend. We will be in touch soon. Take care.